Okay, so many years ago when I first got interested in biology, I went to see my friend, uh, Jin, uh, at the University of Chicago, and uh, Jin Gowasa was a uh, distinguished biochemist who uh, was responsible for discovering the molecule that was the first mega product from, for Amgen. And he told me that he didn't make one dollar out of that invention. <laughs> he just gave it away, <laughs> essentially. So I asked him, you know, what is the most uh, critical uh, issue uh, in biological research, basically. And he said, you know, if he has his wish, he would want to make uh, DNA sequencing a million times better. And so uh, 25 years on, we are in that situation. So at that time, we talked about a billion dollars to sequence the human genome. Nowadays, it's on the order of a thousand dollars. So the, what are these uh, sequence uh, data like? So in the current generation of machine, um, if you, you, know, you can send uh, your blood sample out uh, and pay about $2,000 uh, to a service provider and they would uh, give you your data in the form of about 2 billion reads. Each read is about 100 base pair and uh, the sequence data look like that. The bottom line is the indication of the quality of that particular letter from the sequencing machine. So that quality data is actually much bigger than the sequence data. It goes from you know, 1 to 60. Right? Um, so just storing this data is, uh, you know, take a lot of resource. Um, in any case, um, currently, if you uh, analyze this data, you start from the FASTQ file, which, you know, with the, the data that I just showed you, and it takes, uh, you know, five hours or so to get the this reads aligned to the three billion base pair uh, reference uh, sequence. And then after that, you analyze the, uh, the, the differences between this genome and the reference genome. Uh, and there are many types of uh, differences. And I will go through some of that uh, with you. Um, so the simplest type of difference is a single nucleotide uh, uh, variation, SNVs. And you can see the, the red uh, letter there shows you that uh, you know, there's a difference, right? a single, single letter difference. Or uh, very small insertion and deletion. Those are easy to call if you have the uh, 100 base pair read and by comparison. You can get that immediately. But there are larger types of variations uh, as indicated here in the larger SVs. You have deletion, insertions. And those are currently much uh, harder to, to detect. And um, the reason is that the, the, the variation involves large uh, uh, rearrangement, could be, and you, your reads are only 100 base pair long. And even if, if you have a pair of the reads that is separated by, you know, three or four hundred base pair distance, which is uh, typically produced by the machine, it's still not enough to really cover the whole uh, variable region uh, in detail. So it, it, it's a challenge now to call this uh, structural variance uh, accurately. And um, so part of our, our effort in the lab is to, you know, try to look at a better method to call these uh, larger structural variants. Uh, here I show you an example where our method, uh, this is the ARCSV uh, method down there, and give you a much better reconstruction of this uh, complex uh, uh, structural variants. You see the block B in the reference genome is duplicated, right, and inserted in another position. Um, and then uh, uh, in the ground truth, you can see that there's an extra block B there. And uh, sometimes it's inserted and, and reversed in direction. So it can be very complicated. And so uh, Joey Arthur is a PhD student in statistics, has created some uh, com complex likelihood model that allow us to uh, uh, figure out this rearrangement from the short reads. And then there's another uh, direction in which you just go directly and try to get as long a read as possible. So there are newer technology. Uh, these are based on the uh, single molecule sequencing that can produce reads up to a, a 10,000 base pair long, rather than 100 base pair. Now you have 10,000 base pair long read. So that can, in principle, cover a whole you know, variable region in large scale. And uh, uh, using that, we can uh, get much 
uh, more accurate uh, inference on the, on the variation. But the problem here is that since the signal is generated by single molecule, uh, which is the distinguishing feature in the next generation of sequencing machine, uh, single molecule measurements are inherently highly noisy. So the error rate per base pair is uh, up to 40%. Uh, that's not uncommon. So, so how do you deal with such a noisy but very long read? Uh, that's a, uh, the current challenge. Uh, there's a project going on there also. But now back to the second generation sequencing, uh, just to give you an idea of, of the data. So about 2 billion base pair uh, times 100, uh, 2 billion reads times 100 base pair. So you can figure out the math is, you know, it costs about uh, one, 150 gig of storage, and then the, uh, with the alignment file and so on, you're talking about 200 gig of storage. So storing it for multiple years can cost uh, quite a bit of money. And the, if you store only the differences between this and the reference genome, that's much smaller, it's about two gig. Right. So there are lots of infrastructure issues related to this kind of, of, of data. And now there are many, many projects that are generating up to 100,000. Uh, samples. Uh, this year, I think, you know, uh, the president has just allowed the precision medicine uh, effort, and that would involve uh, about a million uh, individuals. And in China, they just allowed also uh, three projects. Each one is more than 100,000 uh, based uh, uh, individual genomes. So, uh, so we are talking about peta petabytes of data and uh, lots of uh, uh, compute core hours. Um, so, but that's not really the, the major um, uh, challenge. I think the challenge now is in the interpreter. So if I give you uh, an individual uh, genome, what does it mean? What, what can you tell from that genome uh, data? And uh, so this is the challenge of interpretation. So uh, typically uh, uh, a genome would have about, you know, three, two to three million uh, differences. Uh, from the reference genome, there's, there's single nucleotide changes, right? And then there's smaller number, hun hundreds of thousands of smaller insertion and deletion. And then there are thousands of large structural variations, right? So, so um, you know that uh, many of these changes would have functional implications. Uh, and um, so, so the, 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 the question is, you know, which one is important? which one has health implication. Uh, so the functional part of the genome can be roughly classified into coding regions. So here I have a gene that is coded in blue, and the exons are the parts that are encoding protein sequence. Right? So we sort of know how to interpret those. Um, and then there are regulatory regions, such as promoter and enhancers, that are controlling the expression of those genes. And for those, we know much less about. And um, so a, a lot of my lab's effort is in trying to understand these enhancer and promoters and, and understand if there are variations in those regions, what are the implications, right? So in the coding regions, we sort of know how to interpret them, right? So if you have a change that eliminates a stop signal, well, then you will produce a protein that may be much longer than is needed, and that may have consequence. Or truncation, or you may change important amino acid. So these coding regions are easy to interpret. But unfortunately, uh, most of the genomes are non-coding, uh, so yeah, only 1% are coding, right? The, all the rest are intergenic or in, in the introns, so, so that's the challenge of interpreting them. So this these control elements in the genome, the so-called regulatory elements, uh, their functions is context-specific. So here, you know, in, in green, I, I highlight an enhancer that is only functioning in the development of the limb bud in the, in, in the embryo, right? And then you may have another element, enhancer, that is functioning in the uh, specification of the somites and so on. So these are different stages, different um, location uh, part of the body uh, would, would, would be implicated in, 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 uh, in, in these functions. And uh, so the challenge is to you know, identify this and, and predict this. So how, how much time do I have? I'm sorry, yeah, about four minutes. Okay, so uh, let me just, just quickly uh, go 
go through that. So the, the, the approach that we are using basically is uh, relying on two types of data. And one type of data has to do with um, uh, the accessibility of, uh, of the genome. Uh, so here is an experimental assay. This assay was created uh, two years ago by, by Howard Chen and Green Willis Lab at Stanford. And the, the, the peaks here indicate regions in the genome that are open. That means they are accessible by transcription factor to bind and do things to, to, to control gene expression. And so this assay can, you know, based on just, uh, uh, you know, maybe 50 or 100 cells, actually measure this uh, across the whole genome. So we are trying to couple this with gene expression data based on uh, sequencing RNA. And so in the uh, upper panel, uh, you see the um, uh, uh, accessibility uh, signal. And in the, in the lower panel, you see the gene expression. So there's this nodal gene that's highly expressed, and you see upstream from it, there are lots of regions that are opened up uh, by the uh, transcription factors. So basically, we go to the uh, public database and, and you know, download it and pass about you know, uh, 40 to 50,000 uh, data files and created a big table. Um, so the big table is, has this structure. Um, so the lower table there has a, about a thousand different cellular contacts. Each context is a different cell type. Right? For each context, we have in each row a particular potential regulatory element in the, in, in the, in the genome. So that's about a billion uh, rows in this table. And, and this table gives you the how accessible that particular part of the, of the genome is in that cellular context. So that's one type of data. And then on the other hand, we also have the same thousand cellular contacts, but for the gene expression uh, of all the genes. This is about 20,000 uh, 20, genes, right? So that's a small table and a big table. <laughs> one giving you the expression value of the gene that are the targets of those regulatory experiments. The other giving you the old accessibility of those regulatory elements. So from this, we are trying to now do a you know, detailed statistical uh, model building that will allow us to predict which particular regulated element is acting on which target genes under which cellular context. So that is a uh, ongoing effort. So we build the infrastructure. We have been able to use this to extract some what I feel are really interesting signals, but this is still ongoing. It will take a couple of years to complete. So um, I just want to highlight that you know one uh, MCM, ICMU student is involved in, in this. Effort.